Hi, thanks for choosing to listen to my talk today. My name is Annalisa Rillinger, and I'm a fourth year graduate student at Boston University. Today, I'd like to tell you about the research we've been doing recently modeling brown dwarf protoplanetary disks. Um, this research is based on two papers, uh, one that we published last year and one that should hopefully be coming out within the next couple months. Um, so if you are interested in any more details on anything I'm talking about today, I would highly encourage you to go check those out. Um, but with that, let's get started. So the overarching question that we're hoping to address in our research is whether planetary companions can form in brown dwarf protoplanetary disks. So uh, brown dwarfs have been observed to have planetary mass companions um, and uh, protoplanetary disks are thought to be the source and location um, of uh, planet formation. So for example, on the right, I'm showing an image of PDS-70, which is a disk um, that actually shows, uh, you, you can see there's a, an actual planet forming that's been directly detected in that image. Um, so it's pretty compelling uh, that the disks are indeed where planets form. Um, however, one sort of baseline sanity check that we can do um, to make sure this theory makes sense is to check whether there is enough mass in the brown dwarf disks to actually form planetary companions. If the disks aren't massive enough, then we need to come up with an alternate explanation for uh, where the planet forming material comes from. So to that end, we've compiled a sample of 48 brown dwarfs from four different star forming regions. Um, and this actually constitutes the largest sample to date of brown dwarf disks um, that's been uh, consistently studied. Um, so we have disks from Taurus, Ophiuchus, Lupus, and Upper Scorpius. Um, and so not only can we address the general population of brown dwarfs and what their disk masses look like, um, we can also look at how disk mass changes um, over time since the four regions have um, different ages. So how do we actually get those disk masses? Um, I've been saying modeling, what do I actually mean? So we look at the spectral energy distributions or SEDs of these systems, and we model them using radiative transfer code. We use the D'Alessio irradiated accretion disk or dyad models, which enforce hydrostatic equilibrium in the disk in order to calculate its vertical and radial structure. Um, the disk is assumed to be irradiated by the central brown dwarf, um, which is uh, where the name of the code comes from. So Diod takes various uh, disk and brown dwarf parameters as inputs, and we fix as many of these as possible based on values from the literature. So we fix things like the brown dwarf temperature, mass, and radius, the mass accretion rate of material falling from the disk onto the central brown dwarf, and the dust to gas mass ratio in the disk. Um, we assume the standard um, 0 0.01 uh, dust to gas mass ratio. Um, but this still leaves us with some parameters that we can vary, such as the grain sizes of two different dust populations in the disk, large and small grains, um, the disk viscosity, and then uh, the amount of dust settling that has occurred. So how many of those large dust grains have settled downward towards the disk midplane? Um, Dyad uh, is unique in that it actually calculates the surface mass density in the disk instead of um, just assuming something like a power law, um, like some other radiative transfer codes do. Um, and so then in order to actually get the disk mass, which is what we're interested in, we can integrate that surface mass density over the radius of the disk um, and therefore get that disk mass that we care about. So I don't have time to show you all 48 uh, SEDs in my sample, but I'll just show you a sample of four of them here, um, just to convince you that we are able to get good fits to our SEDs. Um, the blue circles are photometry points from the Vizier database. The smaller blue points are the uh, IRS spectra. 37 out of 48 objects in our sample have IRS spectra, which helps us constrain that near to mid IR region. Um, the blue triangles are upper limits. Um, the purple dashed line is the photosphere of the brown dwarf, and the green dashed line is uh, the disk model calculated by Dyad. Um, and so hopefully this convinces you that um, across the board, we're able to get um, satisfactory SED fits for all of our objects. 
So once we get those SCD fits, um, then we're able to calculate the disk masses as I described earlier. Um, and so I'm plotting those results here. This is something called a violin plot. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, such a plot, on the y-axis, I'm showing the total disk mass in units of Jupiter mass. And then we have the four star-forming regions plotted across the um, x-axis in order of increasing age. Um, the horizontal lines represent the minimum and maximum disk masses in each region. So these aren't uncertainties or error bars. Um, this is a total range of the parameters or of the disk mass. Um, and then the blue shaded region corresponds to um, the number of objects in the region with uh, disk mass in that range. So the wider the distribution, the more objects fall into that mass range in that region. Um, you can see that generally speaking, um, we, uh, we do find that um, older disks are less massive, um, which is expected. Um, that's been shown previously. Um, though Ophiuchus, despite being the youngest region, also has the least massive disks. Um, so that's a little bit unexpected, but also not an unprecedented result. Um, for example, Williams et al. 2019 um, also found Ophiuchus to have smaller disk masses um, when they looked at class two objects in the region compared to other star forming regions. Um, they attribute this to possible um, environmental effects from the area around the star forming region. Um, but it's still sort of an open question why that region is so, uh, so less massive. I also want to point out that um, our upper SCO sample is slightly biased. Um, those objects were chosen based on their um, high uh, far infrared fluxes, um, which uh, was done to hopefully make them easier to observe in the millimeter, um, but it also likely skewed those disks um, towards higher masses. And there's probably less massive disks in that region that uh, were not included in the sample. Um, and so its average disk mass is probably artificially high. Okay, so let's put these masses in context um, and get back to the question of planet formation. And so to do that, I'll turn to simulations performed by Payne and Lodato in 2007. Um, and the main takeaway here is that their simulations suggest planet formation is extremely rare in brown dwarf disks with masses greater, uh, less than one Jupiter mass. Um, so the two plots I'm showing you here are from two different runs of the simulation. Um, on the left is a simulation of brown dwarf disks with 0.1 Jupiter masses of material. And on the right is a simulation of brown dwarf disks with one Jupiter mass of material. In both cases, um, basically you create a disk with that given amount of mass, press go and see what sort of planets uh, wind up forming. In the 0.1 Jupiter mass case, uh, you can see very few planets uh, formed. So each of these black points represents one planet that formed in the simulation. The red dashed line represents one Earth mass planet, and the red dotted line represents a 0.3 Earth mass planet. So very few planets formed overall, and almost none uh, were greater than 0.3 Earth masses, and really almost none were greater than one Earth mass. On the other hand, in the one Jupiter mass disk simulations, far more planets formed overall, and a substantial fraction of them are greater than one Earth mass. Um, more specifically, about 10% of those simulations produce a planet greater than 0.3 Earth masses, whereas in the 1.1 Jupiter mass disk simulations, only 0.035% of the simulations produced a planet greater than 0.3 Earth masses. So if we take this one Jupiter mass uh, limit as, as true, um, and we can go back to my results um, and see, okay, well, how many of the disks in this sample actually have greater than one Jupiter mass of uh, material uh, in them? And really across the board, very few disks have greater than one Jupiter mass of material. Um, there's a few, um, you know, three or four disks in Taurus um, that have greater than one Jupiter mass. But other than that, um, the bulk of the objects in our sample are not massive enough for planet formation to occur. Though I do want to note that uh, we can't rule out that planet formation had, may have already occurred in these disks. Um, our models would not be sensitive to that. But at their current masses, very few of these disks are able to form any more planets. 
Um, one other interesting result I wanted to quickly point out is that we're seeing evidence of substructure in some of the disks in our sample. Um, three out of the 48 objects are best fit as pre-transitional disks, um, showing a cartoon of a pre-transitional disk here with the inner disk, a gap where there's very little material um, surrounded by an outer disk. Um, so as I said, three out of the 48 objects are best fit um, as a pre-transitional disk. Um, we also find that 11 out of the 48 objects are best fit as transitional disks. So uh, again, looking at the cartoon, there's no inner disk this time. There's simply um, a large inner hole and the disk wall is located significantly further away from the central brown dwarf. Um, so that's a pretty substantial fraction. 14 out of 48 objects are showing some evidence of substructure um, in their SEDs. And so this brings me to um, work we hope to be doing in the future. Um, which is um, obtaining high resolution ALMA observations um, of these objects. Um, we'd like to follow up on those uh, evidence of substructure and see if we could actually resolve um, any of that directly in the ALMA images. Um, an additional benefit of getting that ALMA continuum data would be we could measure disk radii and disk inclinations. Um, those are parameters that go into the dyad model um, and so having constraints on those parameters would help us constrain the models overall. Um, but for now, I'll just uh, leave you with the conclusions that we've already <laughs> determined, uh, which are that most of the brown dwarf disks in our sample are currently not massive enough to form planets, though we can't rule out the fact that planet formation may have already occurred. Um, and we're also finding evidence of substructure, namely gaps, in uh, a significant fraction of the disks in the sample. So I'll leave my email up here. Um, I know we can't do a live question session, but that doesn't mean I don't want you to ask me things. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Don't hesitate if you have any questions or comments or just want to chat about any of this research. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. And thanks again for tuning in today.